All right, welcome everyone to our Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies seminar series. Um, before we get started, I li like to remind people on Zoom to please put any tech issues in the chat. And also if you'd like to write where you're joining us from today, put that in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions for the speaker, you can put that in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce this week's speaker, Dr. Nathan Seeker. I've been trying to get Nathan here for over a year now, and I think our schedules have finally aligned. Um, Dr. Seeker is an ecologist and conservation scientist interested in human rights and animal welfare in wildlife conservation. Um, I first met Dr. Seeker at Princeton University where we were both PhD students in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Besides his PhD in ecology at Princeton, Dr. Seeker also earned a certificate in environmental policy. He then um, did a AAAS fellowship at the US Agency for International Development in Washington, DC, before moving to India as the Wild World Wildlife Fund's first national lead for elephant conservation. Dr. Seeker is now back in the US. I've always been impressed with Dr. Seeker's ability to span disciplines, including ecology, conservation science, economics, social ecological systems, and psychology. He's written articles on elephants as seed dispersers, human elephant conflict, and engaging with animal welfare and conservation, an article in science that I found particularly provoking. He's also written a book called What's Left of the Jungle, which is a conservation story about the core challenges of conservation in India, told through the perspective of a villager living in um, a tiger preserve. Um, the books received many praises, including from Peter Singer, who says it needs to be read widely, not only in India, but, but by everyone with an interest in conserving biodiversity. Nathan has kindly left us a copy of this book, um, which will should be in the library. He's also written um, a children's book about elephants and a field manual for managing human elephant conflict, um, which will be available in the lunchroom um, today. Um, Dr. Seeker is one of the most inspiring people I know because of his drive to build a better society and his strong ethical compass that, just, that guides him to do so. So with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Nathan Seeker. Um, thanks, Dr. Batterman, for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you for having me today. Um, this is actually my first time speaking to a scholarly audience in about five or six years. So I'm just brimming with things that I want to share and you know get feedback on and get shot down and all that stuff. Um, so I'm going to actually try and fly through uh, quite a few topics. Um, and if I speak too fast and you just can't understand me, let me know. I'll slow down. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll... Uh, have a good question and answer session. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, scientific motivations for wildlife conservation. And I first started thinking seriously about the question about why we conserve animals when I was reading Development as Freedom by Amartya Sen. And so in his book, Dr. Sen is trying to portray what he considers to be the ultimate example of the desperation of poverty. And in doing so, he describes the, the world of the honey collectors living outside the Sundarbans which is a, uh, a wetland that spans um, Eastern India and Bangladesh. And he talks about how even though the honey collectors know that there are tigers in the forest, they still have to go and collect honey um, very regularly. And he says, in a good year, only about 50 or so honey gatherers are killed by tigers, but that number can be very much higher. While the tigers are protected, nothing protects the miserable human beings who try to make a living by working in those woods. And it's not just in the Sundarbans, um, in, in Pilbi Tiger Reserve, there's a woman named Nanki Devi, who's 55 years old in um, 2018. And she was out, I think, trying to serve lunch for her four sons who were working on their um, agricultural fields in Uttar Pradesh. And a tiger sauntered from the trees, grabbed Nanki Devi by the throat, dragged her into the forests. And even though her sons tried, they couldn't save her. Um, there were 19 such deaths in Pilbi that year alone. Uh, the official records suggest that there are about 40 to 50 uh, people killed by, um, by tigers every year in India, but uh, some of my colleagues are actually compiling deaths from the states and have found that it's probably more like about 100 on average a year. And what I've always found curious about India compared to other 
country in the world I've read about is how the government reacts to this sort of thing. Because as far as I know, as you know, China, Japan, Europe, America, as US, as these countries basically accumulated the resources, the technology, and the political power to do so, they immediately started killing and the animals that could take human life or limiting their populations as much as possible. Whereas in India, which is a middle-income country now, um, and that has high levels of poverty, a lot of people susceptible to, to, to these kind of problems, um, and there's a democracy, the government actually spends about $36 million a year to help promote the conservation of tigers in this crowded landscape. And so, you know, to me, this kind of the social justice part of me had this question, right? That many people have asked, why not just let tigers go extinct to prevent the deaths of some of the poorest and most marginalized people in our society? Why are we trying to protect them? And you know, there are you know, many answers that kind of pop up to this question, either implicitly or directly. But the one that I've seen most frequently uh, is actually kind of featured on this plaque right below this picture. And it says, the tiger perishes without the forest and the forest perishes without its tigers. And what um, and so then this, sorry, this picture was in the lobby of W of India, where I, where I worked for several years. And on the W of India website, they kind of go into more detail. They say, the tiger is not just a charismatic species or just another wild animal living in some faraway forest. The tiger keeps populations of wild ungulates in check, maintaining the balance between herbivores and the vegetation upon which they feed. The extinction of this top predator is an indication that its ecosystem would not exist for long thereafter. And this existential claim about the role of tigers is not something that WF India invented. Um, this is a slide I put together while I was in India. So it's India bias, but you can find it all over the world, including at the Smithsonian Zoo. The UN Environmental Program has it in their documents, uh, TX2, uh, the Wildlife Conservation S Society uh, periodicals in India all say something to this effect. This, that you know, the top-down control exerted by tigers helps keep our ecosystems intact. And as far as I can tell, the implicit reasoning communicated by this kind of this kind of narrative is something like this. Conserving tigers does involve some really serious costs. We sometimes relocate people from their traditional homes and place them outside, making their livelihoods more difficult. We constrain what they can gather from the forest. We put them in a place where tigers can kill their livestock when they're already poor. And most tragically, sometimes tigers actually take human life. But those costs are necessary for us to maintain an ecological home, whole, a functioning ecosystem. And so the benefits of conserving tigers, which include the continued existence of forests and all the ecosystem services that come with that, require that we suffer these costs. And you can think of an analogy that you know, we also take for granted, which is about our economic system, right? So car accidents kill a lot of people and they're really tragic. Probably almost all of us know someone who's died in a car accident or had a severe accident. Um, but we can't imagine our economic system without cars. We think that the benefits of having automobiles and that mobility outweigh the sometimes dramatic costs. So, you know, I've been in Indian conservation uh, on and off now for about 15 years. And so I've kind of kept my eyes open for evidence either supporting or contradicting this claim. Um, you'll, I found that none of the pieces that kind of put this claim out front actually include references. Um, and I you know, tried to do literature, literature search on my own. I couldn't find anything. And so I actually spoke to my counterpart. Um, I was a national lead for elephant conservation. Pranav Chanchani was a national lead for tiger conservation. Um, and I asked him if he had seen any literature on this. And he said, the evidence is a little bit thin. There's one paper that talks about this. And it was Thinley et al., um, 2018. And this, was done, this study was done in, in Bhutan. And what they found was in areas that had tigers, tigers pushed those uh, Asiatic wild dogs and leopards out of the forest. And so these, for, these predators would then do more hunting in agricultural lands and therefore uh, reduce crop rating. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting paper. But as an evidence base for this very widely cited claim, it has several weaknesses. One is the finding is a little bit different from the claim. They don't actually talk about forest regeneration. Um, the a second is that the study came out well after I saw this claim uh, you know, pr propagated. But the most bothersome thing is that Tigers are arguably one of the best funded, if not the best funded species for wildlife conservation in the world, especially accounting for purchasing power parity. And there have been hundreds of research papers on tigers. So how is it possible that there's only one or even a couple of studies to substantiate this major claim, which is supposedly the, the primary motivation for why we're conserving tigers to begin with? And when you view this in the broader context of what you know about tigers, there are other logical problems. 
in the, after um, the 1970s, when India got really serious about tiger conservation, uh, a suite of uh, ecologists started trying to understand what was preventing tiger uh, populations from expanding in India, including you know, Dr. Ulas uh, Karanth and James Nichols. Um, and what they found was that what seemed to be limiting tiger populations in India, in India wasn't a shortage of habitat. There were enough places protected and it wasn't poaching of tigers. There wasn't that much poaching of tigers. What they said is that the culprits seemed to be in insufficient uh, availability of herbivores, of prey animals. And they also claimed, um, and others have, have kind of affirmed this claim, that the depletion of the, of the herbivore prey base, uh, of the uh, herbivore population, was mostly due to human overhunting. And so that's a head scratcher, right? If human hunters are able to keep herbivore numbers low, then why do we need tigers? to keep the herbivore numbers low. And I think the truth is that in the modern age, uh, with modern weapons, especially with 1.4 billion people in, in India, human hunters are more efficient than tigers. If we wanted them to regulate the numbers of herbivores in forests to main, make sure forest regeneration happened, they would be capable of doing that. And there would be added benefits. Many people in, in central India and, and these poorer areas actually lack access to good nutrition. So if they were able to hunt these animals, they'd get access to some source of meat. Um, and also, there wouldn't be any man-eating tigers around. So you know, I kind of brought the same thinking to the, the area of elephants. Um, elephants were the animal I was particularly interested in when I started my PhD. Um, and and you know, while also being obviously very charismatic, they're argu arguably the most deadly vertebrate, wild vertebrate in India, uh, aside from snakes. Uh, a 2010 report published by the government called the Gajah Report found that about 500,000 families a year are affected by crop raiding by elephants. Uh, elephants often break into homes looking for alcohol or salt or food. And this can you know, sometimes lead to situations like that you see in the picture where people you know, are devastated and they can't afford to rebuild their home. That can lead to enduring trauma. In 2010, the report found that about 400 people a year were being killed by Asian elephants. Um, now it's closer to 500, according to government records. And again, just to kind of put a, a human face to this, um, my uh, one of my temporary drivers when I was doing my PhD in Buxa Tiger Reserve told me that uh, you know, a particularly violent elephant one day came and knocked down the wall of his house, crushing his mother-in-law and killing her, and then picked up his four-year-old son and threw him onto the road, killing him instantly. And so you know, there are many stories... Uh, of this type. And so again, the question is, what is our justification for working to protect animals that harm our fellow human beings, especially ones that are already kind of suffering the brunt of uh, the misfortunes produced by our society? So uh, elephants are more complicated and interesting than tigers, and so are their uh, ecological functions that, that are prescribed as, ascribed to them. Um, and so you uh, I've listed some of the things that are in the in the literature here. Um, but the main thing that elephants are most frequently cited as doing uh, that's ecologically consequential, especially in the Indian media and press, is that, that is for seeds. Uh, they're often called the mega, mega gardeners of the forest. And so the ecological claim that's made often looks something like this. Uh, Pedro, uh, Pedro Giordano, the ecologist, said that frugivores like the elephants guarantee the persistence of the park. If the interactions documented uh, uh, by seed dispersal ecologists were to vanish, then the whole forest would collapse. And I've certainly said some similar things when people have asked me why we should be conserving elephants. So what's the evidence that elephants are so key for seed dispersal? Um, well, uh, there's quite a bit of literature on this. Uh, Himzo Campus RC and Stephen Blake found that Asian elephants disperse about 122 species from 39 families in Asian, Asian ecosystems. Um, and there are also a few researchers that have tried to understand whether other species would compensate for elephants or the relative importance of elephants as seed dispersers in their systems. Uh, so my PhD was one example of that research. In Buxa Tiger Reserve, I looked at three tree species that you can see on the right there and tried to understand how important elephants were compared to other species for their dispersal. So we did camera trapping and focal watches to see what proportion of fruits are removed by elephants versus other species. 
then for the most important uh, potential dispersers, we fed individuals from those species fruits and then counted how many seeds came out in their in their feces and uh, how, much, how much time it took. We got movement data to figure out how far they go. And then we did germination trials with uh, the seeds that came out of their dung uh, to see if they germinated. And we put all of this information into a model. And we, uh, and we also kind of modeled Jens and Connell effects in intra-dung uh, competition. And we basically found that uh, of the seeds that are successfully dispersed that survived Jens and Connell effects, um, about 60% of the surviving seeds of Delinea indica were dispersed by elephants versus more like 9% uh, for Artocarpus chaplasha on the bottom. But even for Artocarpus chaplasha, uh, without elephants, the median seed would only go about 10% as far as it would in the world with elephants. So the area available to the median seed was about 1% as much um, without elephants as it would be with elephants. Um, and we'd also ran compensation models that showed that elephants were functionally sort of irreplaceable in some sense as, as dispersers for these three species. Uh, I think a really cool study done by Kim Mankanki in Thailand found that elephants are actually responsible for about 37% of Padimitra macrocarpa seedlings in Thailand. So these are actual seedlings that had came up in the, come up in the forest. So there is evidence that elephants are particularly good seed dispersers. But there's still some complicating evidence as well that has made me wonder how important elephants' roles really is in a practical sense for either for people or for the ecosystem. So I did, I think, something that many people do when picking my study species. I didn't pick the species that were that formed the most common trees in the in the forest. I asked the local folks that are working with me, "Hey, what species do elephants eat?" And then I, you know, I picked those three species of my study species, and they are only three percent of less than three percent of the actual individual trees that were found on transects. Um, in addition, I think it's very hard to really project in the future um, and figure out what would happen in a dynamic system. So Delinea indica, which is the species I found to be most reliant on elephants, uh, the reason elephants get to them more than other species is because they're really hard and it's very difficult for other animals to handle them and, and eat them. But then over time, as you can see in this picture, the they get kind of brown and soft, but the seeds are still viable. And so smaller animals can open them up, eat those seeds and disperse them. And, 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 Possibly, possibly disperse them. And actually they, they found in Brazil, Galeti et al. found that their fruits uh, in places where hornbills, sorry, not hornbills, toucans, wrong, wrong system, toucans have been overhunted. And in those places, the fruits just evolve smaller seed sizes relatively rapidly. So it's hard to know exactly you know, how valid my model is for long-term dynamics when it comes to dispersal. But then perhaps an even bigger set of questions come from looking at the Americas where as you all know, megafauna, many mega herbivores were driven to extinction or, or, or went extinct about 10, 11, 12,000 years ago. And so there are still several fruits there that uh, are classified as having a megafaunal dispersal syndrome. The Kentucky coffee tree, the Osage orange, avocados, I assume, are in that, are in that category. And the question then is, if, this, if they're really meant to be dispersed by mega herbivores, how they survived for millennia since those animals' extinctions. Um, there's one study done uh, by Jensen et al. in 2012 showing that Astrocarium stendylanum, and I've never seen this species, you, many of you who work in the tropics might know it better than me, um, but they found that even though it seems like it's suited for mega herbivore dispersal, agoutis are actually able to disperse them over a kilometer just by, you know, by first uh, leaving them in a place and then their caches are raided by other agoutis and then moved through secondarily. And they said, you know, rodents are maybe sufficiently effective to substitute for the primary dispersal of megafaunal seeds by large mammals. And perhaps these plants never depended on megafauna in the first place. And kind of more broadly, you know, even if some species did really suffer when, when the mega herbivores went extinct, it's, it seems as though people generally did very well uh, there until a few hundred years ago. And in addition, we still think of the Amazon today as the prime example of, of a, you know, complete biodiverse, complicated, interesting, functioning forest ecosystem. So again, how much do elephants matter? But maybe the most sort of poignant uh, counterpoint I've gotten about the importance of elephants came from my friend Dire Atri. Uh, so he lived in the same village I did when I was doing my PhD. And one day I was kind of opening elephant dung and counting seeds and he came and asked like, you're so educated, why are you doing this? And I explained, sort of the hypothesis that I was uh, testing for my, for my dissertation. Um, and he said, oh, that's why you want elephants here. 
because you think it's important for them to disperse seeds. Rather, pay us a little and we'll disperse your seeds or we'll plant your seeds for you, right? And it's not a tongue, not just a tongue-in-cheek comment. So uh, I don't know how many of you know the history of uh, Indian forestry, but in the colonial period, uh, the British actually cut down sort of large swaths of natural forest and then had slaves, servants, local people plant commercially important uh, trees in those areas. So Tide's parents, his siblings, that all participated in the system, which continued after independence for, for many decades. So they literally have planted the forest they're living in. And, and there's a study by Moore et al. from 2016 in Malaysia showing that indigenous fruit gardens, so where indigenous people are in the middle of the forest, they're planting trees. These fruit gardens actually can you know, have three times as many large mammals than the silk than the natural forest, right? So people can actually shape these systems to have whatever ecological effect that we might want. Um, but I think the more, even more important point that Tire was making was that, you know, we had to compare the benefits to the costs. So for him, you know, elephants had knocked down the kitchen uh, of his home and they had to pull money together to rebuild it. Uh, they sometimes take 25, 50 in one year all of their rice yield. They made it impossible for them to plant bananas at all. And these are, you know, subsistence farmers. And occasionally elephants had killed one of their neighbors. And so for him, the very idea that the reason to conserve elephants is because they disperse seeds, I mean, it's kind of silly, right? And, you know, I am most comfortable with the, with the world of Indian conservation, but I've been keeping my eye out and I've seen I, I, some of these claims about the, the ecological importance of megafauna um, across the world being challenged uh, as well. And so I'm sure all of you are probably more familiar with than I am with the, with the work that Dipil and Beshta did on the importance of wolves uh, in the landscape of fear, helping limit uh, how much elk browse on aspen, which allows aspens to mature, um, provide homes to, to birds, and then provide trees that beavers can use to form dams and you know, change rivers, as the YouTube video uh, says. Um, and this, is, you know, this isn't like the claim I was talking about with respect to tigers. There's some 25 papers about this. But then when people have tried to replicate their findings, they found that their logical flaws and how things were measured, uh, they didn't necessarily account for it. the fact that human hunting of, of elk had actually gone up at the same time that the elves were reintroduced. Um, and, you know, I've read only a few papers on this, but it, the, the consensus seems to be that the most robust science suggests trophic cascades are not evident in Yellowstone. Um, so a similar thing with sharks. Uh, I've seen sort of uh, both large and small NGOs, including WF, talk about how sharks are one of the ocean's apex predators. Uh, they keep the number of fish lower in the food in check, and somehow through a trophic cascade, this has led to coral reefs, um, you know, being maintained by sharks. So without sharks, coral reefs would be overgrown with algae, and they may not be able to survive. Um, but then uh, these two scientists from James Cook University were commissioned to do a review of the evidence by WF actually, uh, and they found that there's no strong evidence that sharks were a keystone species across. Uh, generally, there are a couple of um, exceptions where they were ecologically consequential. But when it came to coral reefs, uh, they're complex and the role of sharks was contradictory and, and highly contested. So again, it, it may be that sharks play a really, and certain species of sharks play a very important role, but the broader claim used in the conservation discourse isn't yet backed up by the science. And so to me, the question is, are we systematically inflating the practical benefits of conservation in order to have a narrative that serves our objectives? Um, and what does that mean when the folks who are paying the, pay, paying the cost of conservation are often people who have so much less than, than those of us who are making many conservation decisions? And, and so this is something, it's an area of interest that I want to expand into. And I, this is one of those places where, you know, people could really maybe poke holes in, in what I'm in the direction I'm headed, which I welcome. Um, but what I, I'd like to do is maybe systematically look at the claims made uh, with respect to the ecological benefits of conservation and try to understand whether they're logically sound, backed up by evidence, um, still true in the face of modern technology, and how they actually compare to the human and opportunity costs that 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 often come with conservation. So I I obviously understand the 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 desire to make broad existential and ethical claims about the importance of wildlife conservation. Uh, you know we are often in, surrounded by people doing similar things when it comes to climate change or environmental justice or water, and it's kind of hard 
to say we should be funded for a work based on you know aesthetic or cultural values alone. And so I do think you know if we can find ethical reason for wildlife conservation, that'd be good. And I think actually that there is one. There are a set of ethical reasons to conserve wildlife uh, that, and as long as we can do it in a socially just way, that I think we could lean into. And I, India is actually an interesting place because I, that ethical framework is sort of a part of the broader philosophical discourse, even at the ground level. So I had a, um, an assistant named Srishti Kajaria who had a background in psychology. And we tried to do a project, we're trying to work on the project looking at the psychosocial orientations of people towards wildlife. And we, we started the project in Sonpur district, Assam, to understand why, you know, how people felt about the Asian elephant, given that it knocks down their homes and it takes so much of their uh, crops and uh, even occasionally kills people. And one question we asked is, well, why not just remove or cull these crop rating elephants? Would you support the government doing that? And there was a diversity of answers. Some people be like, yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, other people like, no, 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 you know, elephant is Ganesha, is sacred. But other people talked about elephants as individual animals. And they said, you know, these elephants, they're not at fault. They've lost a lot of their habitat. We've knocked down a lot of their forests in the last several decades. So where are they going to find food? They have nowhere to go. And just like when we're hungry, we might have to steal food. These elephants are hungry. And so they need to steal food. And so what they've basically, what folks like this are doing is they're essentially looking at this whole problem through a different ethical frame than we tend to in, in the broader con international conservation world. Instead of thinking of it as, do the benefits of conserving the species to humans outweigh the costs? They're saying, okay, well, here's a creature with needs and wants that I can relate to, that I sympathize with. Do we have a good enough reason to harm this creature? In a sense, it's a less anthropocentric way of doing conservation. And there are lots of non-anthropocentric claims I've seen being made um, recently. But I think the, you know, the fact that animals have thoughts and feelings, that they experience life in a way that might be morally relevant, is backed up by the science. Um, I'm sure many of you heard about the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, in which you know, neuroscientists and neuroanatomists and anatomists uh, kind of pointed out that you know, mam all mammals that we've studied seem to have you know, deep homology when it comes to their emotional systems. They share uh, joy, fear, rage, care, grief, lust, and playful uh, sort of emotional circuitry. Um, and they found that there's some convergent evolution with birds. And you can see their primary claim here in purple that, you know, non-human animals, including mammals and birds, and other creatures, maybe octopuses, also possess the neurological substrates necessary for generating consciousness. And I'm sure you've also seen in the popular press a lot of the um, very good science, actually, documented, showing that a wide diversity of, of, of animals from different taxa can do things that we previously thought were only uh, under the domain of humans and maybe the great apes or a small number of species. This includes tool use, novel problem solving, self-recognition, metacognition, planning, a sense of fairness in capuchins. If you haven't heard about that study, that's a really great one, um, and empathy across several species. And so one argument that uh, I and one of my uh, friends, colleagues, Derek Schiller, made, and this wasn't a novel argument, but we tried to put the best version of it um, in, in, a, in a cogent form, was that you know, biodiversity is important. Like, you know, I think that there's a broad consensus that it's important for cultural reasons and aesthetic reasons, even if it's not always important for functional, ecological, and therefore some ethical reasons. And, but you know, maybe given the evidence that animals suffer and feel and think, Maybe there are ways that we can incorporate the quality of animal life into conservation as well, not just the quantity of species. We can find ways to safeguard animal well-being in addition to traditional conservation objectives, and we can find real practical ways to navigate trade-offs. Right? Animal agriculture is a livelihood for lots of people. Um, you know, invasive vertebrates do some often sometimes pose a threat to to native fauna, and so. But instead of just pretending animal welfare isn't an issue, maybe we can integrate this into into one field. Okay, so that's part one. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is work on uh, the drivers of human elephant conflict. So because of the huge costs on, on human well-being um, of elephant conservation in India, our program when I was at WF India really tried to focus both on science and interventions related to human elephant conflict. And uh, so I'm going to focus on one study more, but I just want to kind of give you a fly through of some of the things we did. 
we did come up with a conceptual model for why human elephant conflict levels might change over time. So it includes things we call push factors like habitat destruction and climate change, um, pull factors like the fact that crops are often more nutritionally dense. So it's for, you know, there's an optimal foraging advantage for animals that come out and get those crops and maybe they're defended less now than they used to be. Human and elephant population growth are sort of related to the resource base available um, in addition to having other uh, another, another relationship with, with the probability of conflict. And we also looked at things that cause worse human elephant interactions. So we came up with this framework and then we tried started trying to put together like good data sets on human elephant conflict that up until then in India at least weren't available. Uh, so one thing we did is we looked we worked with Save the Elephant, Save the Elephants, um, and they had been Googling elephant uh, every like basically every day or every week from 2004 onwards. And they have a huge they had a huge database of newspaper articles, including many that had to do with uh, especially human and elephant death in India. So we coded all those. And we're working with uh, UBC Vancouver, University of British Columbia, to try and understand what might be driving changes in conflict uh, in different places over time. And so one example finding, uh, preliminary finding, is that uh, deforestation for infrastructure seems to be related with human and elephant mortality. Um, we also convinced a couple of state governments in India to open up their files so we could put all their data on human and elephant death due to conflict together and try and understand what might be correlated with human and elephant death at both landscape and state scales. And so one example from uh, Coimbatore district in Tamil Nadu, which is where I lived for the last three and a half years, is that uh, it seems as though elephants were more likely to come out and get killed or die um, when there is like a, you know, a shorter precipitation and water available uh, in, in, the, in their natural habitat. But then when it came to actually kind of providing really local solutions to, to human elephant conflict, we had to take a different approach, couldn't just be quantitative. So we have come up with a, a methodology that's kind of mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative work uh, in hu human elephant conflict hotspots, where we go and talk to all the families of, of people who were killed by elephants and understand what was happening, and then try and come up with like hyper-local recommendations that could help prevent deaths in the future. So for instance, we found that 10% of the deaths that happened in Bolvampati Valley outside of Coimbatore in the last 13 years were, uh, were commuters who were traveling along about 1.5 kilometer stretch um, when they're coming home from work in the evenings. And so extending a bus line that's already there by a couple kilometers could actually reduce the pr probability of fatality there. Um, but the one I wanted to really kind of focus on is this um, exciting, to me at least, exciting experiment on the role that invasives might be playing in, in changing habitat use and therefore as a broad driver of conflict. Um, so many of you might have heard of Lantana camera. It's a uh, woody invasive species that came from South America, was an ornamental plant introduced during the British period and has gradually taken over large swaths of India. Um, there are some forests, some protected areas where Lantana is 60% of the stems uh, in, in, in the pots that they look at. Um, and you can kind of see that it, you know, it can really cover this. That's uh, at scale that, that models the same size as an actual elephant. Um, and so they can really, you know, uh, change how elephants navigate the landscape. And, for, and because this is believed to be largely non-palatable, uh, affect the resource base for other species as well. So this is a picture um, of uh, uh, our field site that we did this experiment in um, before Lantana and this after. And I should talk about the question. So our main question is, does, lan does more Lantana mean less habitat use by elephants and, and other wildlife? Um, and can we, if we use restoration methods, will that increase then how much wildlife use these spaces? So we want to make it from this to something more like this and, and see what happens. So our, um, our, this project was done in um, Bilgiri Ranganathaswamy Temple Tiger Reserve. Um, yeah, there's a couple different names for that. I'll stick with that one. So we'll call it BRT. And so it's, you can see this kind of right here. It's basically in central South India. Um, and this map put together by our collaborators, Atri, who've been working here for a couple of decades, um, shows that there's lots of lantana, right? So this is over 75% uh, of the stems were lantana in large these areas. And so um, we, the Atri has also worked a lot with indigenous peoples in the area, the Soliga um, Adavasis, tribals um, of the region. And so together we came up with uh, a hypothesis uh, about the best way to maybe remove lantana and restore native vegetation um, using a combination of traditional and novel techniques. 
So um, basically the hypothesis is that if we remove lantana using the cut root stock method, so cut it below the, uh, uh, below the ground um, and do weeding once a year, um, and that hopefully will then lead to the return native vegetation. And if we combine it with cool season burns and you know the seeding of native grasses, it could be even more successful. Um, and so ultimately, by the, the the sort of the main I guess ecological mechanism is we're hoping to change the ratio of seeds of native uh, vegetation to lantana seeds in in the seed bank uh, over time. And once lantana changes, we're hoping it'll change the situation for wildlife as well. So. There might be less hiding space for small herbivores and predators, but there should be more open space for large herbivores like the elephant um, and more palatable grasses for herbivores as well. And so overall, our expectation is that intervention should increase habitat usage by wildlife. Um, so our study design is we have taken, found 10 um, blocks, 10 sites across BRT, mostly in the high lantana area. Uh, and in each block, we have six plots. And so the so five of the plots you you can see are kind of put close to each other, about fifty meters apart from each other each. And so each of those plots will get one of five treatment regimes. One is and this is randomly assigned. One is the uh, removal of all the lantana using the cut rootstock method, uh, and that's it. They'll be weeding, but that's it. In the other treatment group, there's removal of lantana plus the distribution of native grass seeds. Uh, in the third one, it's a removal of lantana plus a cool season burn. This is the kind of traditional burn that the um, areas Adavasi used to do before um, so-called modern forestry. Um, the fourth regime is the removal of lantana plus a cool season burn plus a seeding of, of native grasses. Um, then we have one of these, which is the control. So there's no removal um, of lantana. Um, and then there's one more control that is farther away, about 200 meters away in some random direction where we don't do anything. And that's to help us kind of measure the spillover effects um, from from the you know the nearby plots on the near control, so we did one year of baseline collection, and then we were able to do the removal. There's been a political issue with the burning, so hopefully we'll do that in the next couple of months. Um, and we've done the seeding as well, and we had planned to have three years of treatment of monitoring post treatment. Um, so what are we measuring? Well, we have a you know, we're we're measuring everything we can given the resources we have. So we're looking at percent cover of grass versus litter and bare ground. Uh, the GBH of uh, you know, and the number of trees of different uh, of girths, species composition and canopy cover, um, grass and lantern biomass, navigability. We're trying to measure how hard it is for animals to use the space, as well as uh, soil nutrient levels. Um, on the wildlife side, which is what I'm sort of more involved in, um, we're trying to use camera traps to try and measure the the uh, the habitat usage of of these different plots by different species, and see how that changes over time. So um, we're a year and a half into the experiment. We haven't analyzed too much quant quant of the data yet, but you can see here pictures of some of the wildlife in the baseline part of the study. So lantana is thick, but it's, it's, it's being used um, quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I think one loser from the removal of lantana, my current hypothesis, it would be the, the mouse deer or chevrotain. And these little guys seem to have, I don't think that lantana impedes their movement too much. It probably protects them gives them some refuge and I think they're getting a lot of food and they're just, I've never seen one in real life, um, but it's a tons of them in, in these in these camera trap photos. And we're also finding that, you know, maybe things are a little bit different than we thought. Lantana might have naturalized. Uh, this is a sambar deer. This is the largest uh, wild deer in, in India. And it's uh, eating lantana, browsing on lantana. So, um, you know, and despite being such a large animal, we found it in our, a lot of our plots. So we might not have the same winners and losers as we expected uh, in this experiment. And I've uh, you know, worked with a colleague of mine, um, E. Somanathan from the Indian Statistical Institute to come up with what we think is a really robust way to actually kind of separate the treatment effect from the spillover effect, um, despite only having 60 plots. And so anyway, I'm excited about this. And so we'll see, see how that goes. Okay. So then the last, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the efforts we're currently making to try and manage human elephant interface. And at least for me, before I, I joined an NGO, I would have maybe been surprised by the, the kind of variety of things that, uh, that we ended up trying. So I just want to share some of those with you before focusing on one of them. So um, you know, one thing that we did when the Uttarakhand, uh, so Northern state in India, uh, when the Uttarakhand government decided that they want to 
denotify an elephant reserve to expand an airport. We were part of a, a really kind of inspiring broad-based advocacy effort to try and convince the government that elephant reserves should be safeguarded as, as they're supposed to be. Um, we also did a project on, on train elephant collisions. So trains kill about 17 elephants a year um, in India. And uh, you know, this is not a huge number, but the, the, the way these, some of these animals die is, is truly horrendous. It can, be, it can be a slow and painful death. Uh, and it really uh, pulls the heartstrings of the public. And so I think we have the most in-depth study um, with the design uh, expert on, on how we can maybe find, come up with cost-effective uh, interventions to deal with that. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we've come up with a children's book about elephants. Um, it, yeah, I helped write it. So it was supposed to be for eight-year-olds. It's probably for 15-year-olds because I don't have that skill set. Um, but the idea is that it's been translated into Tamil, Malayalam, Hindi, um, and it's in English as well. And we want to, we're distributing it to people who actually live alongside elephants because um, they all, may know something about elephants from observing them, but some of the cool things we know from modern science isn't accessible to them. Uh, we've created a IKEA inspired a guide for building non lethal fences. Um, so the idea is that people have an alternative to killing the elephants that are raiding their crops. Uh, and we've co-published a field manual for managing human elephant conflict with the Indian government, Project Elephant and the Ministry for Environment, Forest and um, Climate Change. And so this guide includes, is, you know, it's also been translated to a whole bunch of Indian uh, regional languages. Um, and it provides a set of kind of best practices. And also it provides clear guidance what data should be collected. So we can actually see what happens over time going to be very hard to get it actually implemented, but WF is trying really, really hard. Um, so we have a copy of that if you all want to see it at lunch. But the thing I want to talk about and wrap up with um, uh, in, in detail is uh, an evaluation we've done of a low cost scalable intervention to try and reduce uh, human elephant conflict, especially mortality. Um, so basically what happened, I think, organically across Asia and Africa is that conservationists try and find tried to find a, a cost-effective way to reduce crop rating by elephants, um, because you know in theory you could just build barriers everywhere and that should do it, but that's not affordable in these settings. And so what many people seem to have landed on independently is organized crop guarding, which the community is taught to kind of sort of more effectively push elephants away and drive them away from from their crops. Um, and so. Basically, locals are trained to connect with government officials, so they have some, you know, sort of support from 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 uh, from the political apparatus, and then they're given, you know, flashlights, firecrackers, that sort of thing to help drive elephants away. And WF India got in on this really early. In two thousand four, they started a program for anti depredation squads. So this, you know, it's another name for this organized guarding and driving intervention. And so they went starting in two thousand four. They went to communities that were beset by human elephant conflict in, in Swanpur district of Assam. And in these villages, they'd find about 10 to 15 volunteers, uh, provide them searchlights and firecrackers, and be, they'd be trained to contact the forest department. Often they'd had, you know, these people had no real contact in the government before. They're trained about who to contact. They're taught how to kind of keep the elephants at bay until the forest department came. And then they were taught to assist in these short distance drives. And the goals, according to a WF report, are to minimize crop damage and property damage, but also loss of human life, um, presumably during chasing um, uh, or by, due to accidental encounters. And since they'd reduced losses to elephants, the idea was that this would hopefully curb retaliatory killing of elephants or reduce elephant deaths due to conflict, and also improve support for conservation institutions. Because um, there was local people weren't always in good, you know, didn't have good relationships with, with the Forest Department or WPF. So what we did, um, made possible by just amazing work by my uh, colleagues from WF India on the ground is a pretty robust impact evaluation of how these ADS has affected human and elephant mortality. And so the main question we addressed is, are anti-depredation squads associated with a decrease in human death or elephant death due to conflict? And our estimation strategy was pretty simple. We have data on the number of humans and elephants killed um, per village per year across zones per district. And that, you know, actually reconciling the data with census villages is something only that our local partners could do. And so that's, um, I, we really owe them for that. Um, and then we would compare the mortality of humans and elephants uh, in villages with and without active ADSs. Um, so before and after treatment and also looking at 
um, villages that never got ADSs compared to ones that did. So our population of interest was basically villages that were accessible to elephants in, in Sonapur districts. So this is a map of the, of the district, this whole thing. Um, and elephants could either get to villages that we figured about or about a kilometer from their habitat. So that's the green on the north and south or within about half a kilometer from these elephant movement paths, which were again, painstakingly uh, mapped by my colleagues at Above India. Um, and there's some other villages accessible via T estates in the area. Overall, our sample was 636 census villages over 20 years from 1999 to 2018. And so I'm gonna just show you the, the, the statistical model because I want you to see kind of the, the lengths we went to to control for uh, issues that come from having a non-experiment, you know, it's not a random assignment of treatment. Um, so we, our outcome variable was either human deaths or elephant deaths in village I year T. Um, our main predictor of interest was whether village I had an ADS or not in year T, not including the year it started in case a death had happened earlier that year. We didn't want to bias the results. Um, we also, in, in our primary model, we had a village fixed effect so that we're only comparing each village to itself over time. We also had an alternative differences and differences uh, construction where we had a dummy for any villages that ever got a treatment, um, allowing us to compare always control villages to any villages that ever got a treatment. Uh, we also had a year fixed effect so that we can control for common trends. Uh, we had a variable to account for the possibility, actually the, the likelihood that WF wasn't just randomly selecting when to go into villages, right? WF was probably going to go to a village when there had been acute conflict in that year or the previous couple of years. And so we want to control for potential mean regression. Uh, we also control for spillover. You know, ADSs could, in theory, lead to changes in conflict in neighboring villages in either positive or negative ways. And we then had a bunch of confounders that changed differently over time across different villages that we want to account for. So we included um, the, uh, the proportion of the surrounding area that was natural habitat versus agriculture the proportion of the village area that was crops, um, the distance of these villages from the forest or elephant movement paths, nightlight data, which is supposed to be a proxy for development, and human population. And so here are our results. Um, when it, and this is from our main, um, our, our main model specification, but it's corroborated across all specifications. So um, ADSs were uh, uh, basically, uh, with, didn't seem to have a, a clear effect on human death. Our, the results were inconclusive. Um, ADSs were placed in villages that had um, just experienced more human or elephant death in the last two years. So it was good that we controlled for that because we were, uh, my team was uh, putting in these institutions on randomly. There is no evidence of a spatial spillover really. Um, and the big finding, which is really unfortunate is that it seems as though elephant deaths were actually higher in communities that had anti-depredation squads than those that didn't. Um, they have a, had about 1.8 more elephant deaths per 100 villages per year, because this is a rare event, um, than, uh, than those same communities when they didn't have ADSs. Their baseline was closer to one. Um, so yeah, so, the, so what does this mean? Well, the way I read this is that ADSs were very ambitious. They were supposed, they're trying to kind of affect all things related to conflict at once. They're supposed to reduce crop damage and you know, re reduce mortality and improve relations with conservation organizations. But it seems that maybe there are actually trade-offs involved in this. Um, you know, my colleagues th got feedback over the years that ADSs did improve their relationships with the forest department and with conservation organizations. Um, and they, you know, they did, people told them that they felt that crop losses were lower. Um, and maybe that's just at odds with what is happening to elephants. Um, it seems we don't, uh, we're, we're working on the mechanism now with, to the degree we can with the data we have, but it seems based on the other literature that elephants are often stressed out by drives. And it could be that when they're trying to run away that they're more likely to run into a, a power line, fall into a, a, a ditch in the tea garden, um, or, you know, to, um, to get hit by a train, um, that happens too. So maybe that's what's happening, but you know, Colleagues and I have talked about this. Like basically there was 16 additional elephants that died associated with ADSs over 20 years, imperceptible to the human mind, right? And this is the kind of thing that you're not gonna find unless you do a rigorous statistical analysis. And to me, the most valuable thing coming from this study is, is that you know, conservation should continue to get more serious about doing rigorous evaluations on the most important metrics related to these conservation issues.
Um, anyway, that's it. Um, thank you so much for uh, your time and for uh, letting me uh, share as much as I can with you. Thank you, Nathan, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we'll now take questions from the audience. And if you're online and have a question, please put it in the Q&A. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, and I'm supposed to repeat the questions, I think. So um, then tell me if I'm summarizing correctly. You're asking how traditional eco ecological, ecological knowledge, especially with respect to managing human elephant conflict, might have changed over the last couple hundred years. Um, so I so I think there's just a lot of variation um, across India on, on this question. Um, it's widely believed that uh, Adivasi groups that have lived alongside elephants for a long, continuously for a long time just seem to have a better idea of how to deal with human elephant conflict. Um, so they just know how to stay safe. They're less likely to be um, to, to do something that causes the elephant to, to attack them. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of my colleagues claim that the, the biggest issues are with newcomers to these regions who don't have that sort of, that, those kind of, I guess, social skills, basically, multi-species social skills um, to keep from getting in trouble. Um, and, and certainly, it seems that a lot of these indigenous people sort of take for granted that some amount of what they grow is going to be taken by elephants. And they, you know, sometimes they're framing it in religious terms, sometimes in terms of sharing. Um, but that also changes how they react, right? They may not get as upset um, as, as maybe other people who are more commercial oriented when it comes to their agriculture. Um, so, um, so that's largely, largely anecdotal, but there's, you know, there's, there's not, nothing genetic about this, right? So there's parts of central India where elephants used to live 500, 600 years ago before the Mughals came, I think broadly hunted them out. And now elephants are going back there. Um, because of successful conservation efforts. And a lot of those people don't know what to do. Um, they're much more likely, it seems, to get in trouble and get killed. Um, some of them flee and climb trees and sit in the trees um, as they, as elephants kind of, you know, sort of have their way with their, with their home. So um, I think they're, my best guess at this point, not being an expert in this, and I don't think it's been studied fully either, um, my best guess is that there are some soft skills and there are definitely cultural perspectives on how to deal with this that help manage conflict. Um, but they can erode. Um, and they're also changing it over time as people get, you know, some of the youngsters are like, oh, I, I want to buy a phone. <laughs> like this elephant's more annoying and they don't, they may not accept all the uh, traditional beliefs. And I um, mean, Christianity also in the Northeast apparently has had some effect on how people see wildlife. Um, whereas traditional knowledge might have looked at different species differently. Um, sorry, that's a, but when it came to working with the Solagas for fire management, um, it was really interesting because they used to, you know, they used to light fires and it's been interesting to see how the older generation still remembers that and the younger generation just doesn't you know, they don't know how to use fire to manage the forest. Please, sorry. Um, you want to poke holes in your argument, so I, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Great. Research that you cited about you know what the problem benefits are about the negative model fire extinction are just based on what is present. And the thing is that the vast majority of negative model extinctions occurred thousands of years ago. And you see very few of them are being relatively seen are happening now. So I guess my the whole other approach I've done paleontological research on negative model extinctions is that to really understand what the effect is of an extinction, you have to look into the past. And looking at the effects in the present, and the ranges are already so restricted, and perhaps the ecological functions of megafauna have already been affected greatly by loss of genetic diversity, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't really give you a clear picture of what would happen if they were allowed to be extirpated from the area. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, it sounds like, yeah. So let me answer that in two parts. I, I think 
in the Asian con context, I would totally agree that um, probably 20,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, when we had way more megafauna around in a place like India, that their ecological consequences were, were much larger. Um, and that if you were to snap your finger and move them, or if we were able to study what happened in that period, you would find that a lot of, you know, several things changed. Um, and, you know, and even more, we're even less clear about what happened about extinctions. It's very hard to know what happened with extinctions in the Americas that, you know, and I think I'd love to talk to you about, about what you know about this stuff and, and learn from it. I guess what I'm saying in, in, for, this, for this part of the talk was much more sort of on the practical side of things about the way we communicate conservation. For all of the, you know, sort of the simplification uh, that's happened with ecosystems in India um, and the potential downsides of that, India is now a middle-income country. Like the Indian government is the second most successful institution for raising people out of poverty in human history after the Chinese government. <laughs> um, and when it comes to like, you know, maybe there's a trade-off, right? Maybe we did lose some things ecologically that could have helped in certain ways, but trade-offs have to be looked at holistically. And we'd look at both the costs and the benefits. Um, and in the in the current context, if you tell me that the best reason to save elephants is because of the, their ecological role, um, I, I I would kind of disagree that that's the strongest argument, or even that the argument would ultimately pan out when you look at some of the costs. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that you know this isn't a statement on whether megafauna have been or can be ecologically consequential. Uh, the question is in the real world right now. Um, what are those consequences and how do they compare to the costs? I didn't repeat that question. I sorry, my bad. Um, hopefully the okay. So there's a guy named Nishant Srinivasaya, um, who I think just, you know, he's about my age, so uh, I think one of the best elephant ecologists of, of my generation, um, who is basically trying to look at how elephant behavior is changing in Southern India as, as opportunities, ecological opportunities change. Um, and so he's part of a group of people who've demonstrated that, you know, now males are forming all male herds and they're like, you know, things that we haven't seen in, in populations in you know, natural habitats um, where they, they kind of, you know, even at the age of seven, they leave, they join an all male herd and they, go and start raiding crops um, you know, systematically. And then they just hang out in the middle of the day in a, in a village tank, you know, what, what during the day when they're visible and then at night they go back out. Um, and he's also shown how like, you know, they're, they're, well, and many people are showing this, that elephants are just systematically learning how to, um, how to, you know, deal with all the barriers we put in their, in their way. So like the single strand fence, I show, I show like a manual, right? For creating a single strand fence. That'll only work in Northeast India and Central India where elephants haven't been exposed to them. In South India, there's no way. Elephants have figured out that the bottom of their feet don't conduct electricity, that their tusks don't conduct electricity, that if they can pick up a piece of wood and drop it, that'll work. Um, and so basically you have cultural knowledge, right? That this interface of human humans and elephants. Um, and, and one thing that, um, I didn't get to go too far in this, but we wanted to kind of break this down into concepts, right? So like conductivity electricity is one concept, sort of the structure of a different of fences, because there's also hanging fences that are too high for the elephants to drop something on. So then that's like, they had to figure out how to deal with that structure. And it would be, I think, you know, that's one area that could be studied is how concepts like this um, kind of spread uh, in, um, in, in these elephant populations. But that's one thing in our management tools as well. We're like, if you have one elephant that's figured out how to break things down, you might want to act pretty quickly because other elephants will learn. Um, and the faster that knowledge spreads, 
the, the lower your you know, the longevity of this particular intervention tool. And you're gonna have to kind of escalate the more next more expensive tool to manage their behavior. Did I answer your question? Okay. And I again forgot to summarize the question. I apologize to people online. Ah. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, so um, the question, as I understood it, was um, basically um, if, given that so India has sort of resisted removing individual animals, but when they do, um, is it effective? Um, and to what degree might that effectiveness be related to you know? In, is it the individuals have these traits, and therefore, if you remove the individual, the problem kind of goes away. And to what, to, or to what degree that if you remove one individual, will other individuals just kind of come into that space? Is that a fair summary of your question? Okay, um, you can tag on if I if I miss a part. So, um, yes, yeah, so they do they do try removing individual elephants. Um, uh, there's there's a there's a whole protocol in the Wildlife Protection Act about uh, how that can be done, um, and so the removal. Occasionally is culling, so ultimately uh, every now and then there'll be an, an elephant, like the one who um, killed my my driver's son. Um, that's going on, just doing this habitually, and they will they'll just they'll kill that animal. Um, which makes sense to me. Um, and other other times they will either they'll capture it and either put it in captivity or they'll translocate it. Um, so uh, translocating the animal doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, animals tend to tend to come back. Um, and putting them in captivity obviously has a bunch of other kind of ethical questions with it. Um, as far as to what degree that it, it, it those you know, that removing the individual affects the problem, it seems to vary. So uh, there's one area in Western Karnataka where they removed a bunch of elephants, and they, they thought that these elephants, this herd or these two herds, were causing all the problem. And once they removed them, other elephants came in, and it just they just you know it just it seemed like. There, people, the elephants are just sort of waiting for that for that niche to open up. Um, in other situations, when there, I think a smaller number, one or two individuals that are causing a lot of problem, if that individual is killed or captured, it does seem to like that spate of killings will will stop, or you know there'll be less damage done in that area for a while. Um, so, and it seems, and maybe this is a cop out, but it seems like it's context specific. Sometimes it really is an individual making the difference, and other situations there's a it's just an a niche that's going to be filled no matter what you do does that answer your question more or less okay all right i think let's stop there um thank you Nathan, for um, sharing your really fascinating work with us thanks so much for having me appreciate it